Hi, everyone. Welcome to Time Sensitive. This week, Spencer's in conversation with the climate justice activist Gia Bastida. She is the co-founder of ReEarth Initiative, an international youth-led organization that focuses on highlighting the intersectionality of the climate crisis. What did you guys talk about? Well, first off, I want to point out that Gia is the first guest on Time Sensitive we had on who's in her 20s. She is 20 years old, to be exact, and a junior at UPenn. She first came to my attention through my friend, the fashion designer, Gabriella Hurst, who invited her to the Met Gala earlier this year. And Gia was born and raised in Mexico by an indigenous community leader, father of the Otomi Toltec people and a Chilean ethnoecologist mother. When she was in high school, the family moved to New York, and that's when she got involved in climate activism and the Fridays for the Future movement. Some people have likened her to a Greta Thunberg of America. I think that's unfair. She's really her own force with an incredible vision, all her own. And so on the episode, we talk about all of her work she's done in this area over the last decade or so. We talk about effective strategies for climate activism, indigenous wisdom, and ancestral knowledge, and how stubborn optimism is necessary to the climate movement. Fascinating. I'm really excited to hear this episode. Before we get into it, we'd first like to thank our season six sponsor, Le Col School of Jewelry Arts, which is supported by the Maison Van Cleef and Arpels. Through courses, talks, masterclasses, field trips, exhibitions, and publications from its campuses in Paris and Hong Kong, and through traveling schools hosted in cities such as Tokyo, New York, and Dubai, Le Col shares jewelry culture with as wide an audience as possible. At the root of Le Col's array of offerings is its world-class research department. Since 2017, 10 research programs have been initiated on subjects ranging from the pearl trade between the Middle East and France in the early 20th century, to the history of jewelry design from the Renaissance to the current day, to the links between jewelry and literature. Bringing an incredible level of knowledge and rigor to all that they do, the research department has forged links with institutions such as the French National Museum of Natural History, as well as with universities. In 2019, Lecole created scholarships intended to assist students enrolled in a research master's degree program and working on topics related to jewelry, either in art history or gemology. You can find out more about Lecole and its research department at www.lecolevancleefarpels.com. That's www.lecolevancleefarpels.com. And now here's Spencer and Gia. Hi, Shie. Welcome to Time Sensitive. Hi, thank you for having me. So I thought we'd start this conversation with this particular moment we're in. We're talking in early August 2022. Our listeners will be hearing this in September 2022. And just last week, Joe Manchin's Inflation Reduction Act, with its $369 billion toward what they say are climate and clean energy initiatives, was announced. Those in support of it argue it could reduce American carbon emissions by 40% compared to 2005 levels by 2030. What are your thoughts? Well, I've heard a lot of conversations about this. I'm actually part of an advisory council for Climate Power, which is a group of experts that get together to talk about climate policy at the national level. And I've heard many climate experts like Michael Mann, Leah Stokes, talk about the bill. And the main thing that I am getting out of it is that even though it is not what I and we would like in the climate community is the best we have. I mean, it's called the Inflation Reduction Act. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's the best we can get. And the reason why is because of the fact that the Democrats are not really being able to pass climate legislation. I would say that the red flags for me are what you said, the 2005 levels. We need... 40% reduction from 1990 levels. That's what the IPCC report says. And Biden has been saying the 40% reduction, it's one of the check marks that he gets, but 
if you move the timeline, you're messing up with communication and you're messing up with our minds, really. Um, and the second part is that I don't see much money going towards the climate justice aspect of it. We're talking about renewables, but renewables, if we also get fossil fuels 10 more years, there's almost no words uh, to think about the the magnitude of the crisis that we're in and seeing people really play with numbers like they don't mean anything. So my perspective is, as that the one of experts, uh, that's what I'm listening to, is that we still have to push for it. But there is no reason why we cannot still criticize it and say that we deserve better. Mm. And you mentioned the IPCC report, which came out earlier this year, and that painted a really bleak picture, like 50% of the land on the planet is now at extreme risk. Yeah. I mean, I cannot even envision how much that is. I don't think anybody can. Um, what I know is that it looks different in every single place around the world, which is why uplifting different people's stories is important. Somebody who's facing sea level rise is different from somebody who's facing wildfires, different from somebody that's facing illegal cut of their rainforest. So we need to diversify to talk about the climate crisis because over the years, uh, the traditional environmental movement has put into our minds that it's just about protected areas, just about polar bears and just about melting ice when it's so many things. And that's what I hope is going to get people involved. The fact that every time I learn about something new, whether that be water or food or fashion, I care even more because I realize how multi-sectoral this crisis is. And Writing about this mansion bill in the New York Times last week, the climate journalist David Wallace-Wells wrote that in less than five years, a new generation of activists and aligned technocrats has taken climate action from the don't go there zone of American politics and helped place it at the very center of the democratic agenda, persuading an old guard centrist septuagenarian, Biden, to make a new deal scale green investment the focus of his presidential campaign platform and his top policy priority in office. Is this how you see the current moment and situation? And what does that sort of, that sentence, that quote make you feel? Well, for me, I think that I remember when the race, the presidency was happening. I was at the CNN town hall where all of the candidates were speaking about their climate plans. And Biden was at the end of, ambition, let's say. He was the last one that I would vote for based on the, his climate plans. And to see that he became the president, obviously, for climate, I mean, obviously, it's better than, than Trump. But at the same time, we have to remember that the information that the Democratic Party has is vast. It's very, very up to date, really. The, the White House has a a climate advisory where my friend Jerome is in. Biden held the climate change summit in Earth Day that I spoke at. I was the only civil society member to speak to 50 leaders around the world. And so that for me, you know, it was very hopeful to see how it was starting. But to see that Biden, you know, has all of the resources that the Democratic Party was exhibiting is the only thing that gave me hope because he was not in the in the front lines of being the best at climate policy. And now what I'm seeing is that it's obviously getting a lot harder to pass any climate legislation. We saw what the Supreme Court did uh, in terms of telling the EPA you cannot regulate greenhouse gas emissions. And the EPA has to be able to protect us, protect people, because what the U.S. does actually affects the whole world. Like We cannot just think that what's happening in the U.S. stays in the U.S., and that is the responsibility of being a world leader. And so for me, it's like punches from every single corner coming into the climate movement. And I'm not from the U.S. I wasn't born here. I moved here when I was 13 years old. I didn't know anything about U.S. policy. I studied constitutional law in high school for two years. And what I can tell you is that we have the right to happiness. And everything that the government is doing right now, what the Supreme Court is doing is taking away that happiness, that security for joy in the future. Because I don't really understand how it got politicized so much. In no other place in the world are we asking, is the climate crisis real or not? 
And that is the conversations that we're still having in the United States. So for me is how do we appeal to maybe the emotional side, that's what we have to do, of companies, of policymakers and say, we are really fighting for our lives right now. I can uplift the messages of scientists of the IPCC, but maybe you're not going to hear them. What you're going to hear is that I'm scared. And if, if that's going to move you, then let that be what moves you. Especially after hearing that quote from David. You know, I think that the scientists are in this space where they are not doing science anymore. They're just trying to communicate it to people so they act upon it. And bodies like the White House and the Democratic Party have to recognize that the climate crisis is number one because it exacerbates every other crisis and it's not being framed that way. A few years ago, when you were 17, you, you called out a group you labeled Doomers. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, a play, I'm sure, on Boomers. Yeah. And, and you said our biggest problem is not denial. Our biggest problem is apathy. And that's what Doomers are. They write articles in New York Magazine saying, we're all going to die, so okay, Doomer. <laughs> and, you know, I assume you were talking about David, or at least his terrifyingly bleak, uh, uninhabitable Earth essay and later book. But more recently, he's actually kind of had this about face, or at least turned toward optimism. And that's how he put it recently on this interview mm. with Andrew on Time Sensitive. And, and his writing in The Times seems to be kind of bearing this out recently. I was wondering, have you seen a shift more recently to some of these people you would have called uh, doomers a few years ago? And is the climate movement, generally speaking, getting more optimistic? Do you sense that there is a shift in tone from, say, five years ago? Well, I actually wasn't talking about David, and I think the people who I'm talking, calling doomers are people who just don't have faith in the fact that we can change the world. And I think if scientists are raising the alarm, it's because they know that every single thing we do matters, every fraction of a degree matters, and it matters especially for frontline communities. It is never too late because there's always going to be something to save. The question is, how much do we save? And so the OK Doomers is definitely a play on words on boomers. And the reason why I did that is because this cannot be an intergenerational fight. It cannot be us on the street saying it's your fault because it is actually the fault of the industries that have lied to us, the fossil fuel industry, the plastic industry. Those are the industries that have created the narrative that first of climate denialism, but then of what is your carbon footprint? What is your, uh, did you recycle today? And that makes us as individuals feel like it's our responsibility to do everything right ourselves. And it cuts us from community. And what we are doing is saying we have to get together, not only with all my peers, but also with people who have incidents in institutions. And we have to have conversations with scientists, with policymakers, with companies, with academia and say, we can only speak louder, but you know how to change the place that you're part of. And I think the doomers are those who say, what are these kids doing here? What are they talking about? It's too late to do anything about the climate crisis. And I don't think these conversations are worth our time anymore. Before, I thought they were. I thought that if I spent 30 minutes talking to a climate denier, I could change their minds saying, okay, if you don't think that it's the planet is warming up, what about all the pollution? Do you like your water to be dirty? Do you like your air to be polluted? And maybe I got some response there. But what we really need to do is the people who already know it's a problem, make their minds work in an intersectional way, which means how is what you're doing being mindful of frontline communities, of not just about the warming of the earth, but how these solutions can actually exactly. be more just oriented, justice oriented. Well, well, right before you arrived here today, I was actually reading this Harvard Business Review article that was just published this week titled, We Can't Fight Climate Change Without Fighting for Gender Equity, hmm. which seems like an obvious thing to say to those who are paying attention to the conversation and who are thinking in these intersectional ways. But still, it was so refreshing to see a business magazine 
publishing mm. a headline like that. And the authors note in it that while women are especially vulnerable in this climate crisis, they're also uniquely positioned to act as powerful agents of change. On average, women have smaller carbon footprints than men, more responsible attitudes toward climate change, and greater interest in protecting the environment. And this intersectionality is such a central tenet of your work. I mean, I couldn't help but think of you when I was reading this article. And I was just wondering how you think of gender specifically in the context of this conversation. Well, for me, and some of the statistics say, for example, in countries where there's drought, women are at higher risk of being violentized because they have to walk further to get water. That's the main example we always get, uh, how unsafe the conditions get with the climate crisis exacerbating basically access to sanitation, access to, to safe drinking water. But for me, it goes deeper than that because when you are exploiting Mother Earth, is exploiting femininity, is exploiting women. Uh, and maybe that doesn't make sense to a lot of people. But in my worldview, it is a very, very clear example. And maybe people in the United States won't get it, but ask anybody in Latin America that when women are violent, I'm getting the word wrong, sorry. English is my second language. Uh, women are threatened and attacked just for being women. There is no other reason. And it's just because they're women. And that's what ha is happening to Mother Earth the body that gives us everything that we need to survive and thrive and take care of us. And we're not taking care back. I come from culturally from an indigenous community, the Otomi Toltec peoples. And we practice this reciprocity. If I take, I must give back. And it's what moms do. It's what women do. And what has happened to our international relations, I took an international relations class in college, is that our framework for how to have negotiations among countries is emotions have to be taken out of negotiations because they don't work. That's realism, which is older. We don't really use it anymore, but that's the foundation of our world. And, you know, there's feminist critiques to this, this worldview. And the critique says, we are emotional as humans. If you take emotion out of decision-making, you are creating a world where you are giving path to violence. And so for me, when you realize that we have to protect women's rights, it has to come together with the fact that we have to protect Mother Earth because women are more closely tied with that instinct of protection. So whatever policy you put forward, you're going to do it in both fronts. So, yeah, it's, it's a more interconnected way of looking at it. I mean, someone I think who's written just beautifully on this subject is Rebecca Solnit. Her writing sits squarely between feminist teachings and the climate and the way she writes about America, the way she writes about the West, the way she writes about nature and what we're facing, but also the hope and opportunity. So it's sort of interesting. I wanted to turn to time and especially how you philosophically think about time in relation to the climate crisis. You've previously noted that the planet's suffering and we don't have the luxury of time anymore. And elsewhere, you've said we're running against time now more than ever. Could you elaborate on this? Yeah, the IPCC report gives us the 2030 timeline, uh, deadline, I must say. And we're not creating timelines that let us get to our goals. We are putting faraway goals without specifying how we're going to get there. And that is where our policy comes in. Policy to implement renewables for a just transition. I think as a student, and this might resonate with all students, you know, when there's a deadline, you get things done. And that's not what's going on here. It's different than any other generation before. And the reason why is because the science is telling us that we are about to go through tipping points that are irreversible. And when we cross those tipping points, we're not going to be able to, to have the world that we deserve. And from my worldview specifically, every decision that is a seven generation principle, every decision that you make has to be done with the seven future generations in mind, with the wisdom of the past seven generations. We are not thinking 
in generations. We are thinking quarters. We're thinking in elections. And it's so important for me to always remind myself and to tell people, we are not inheriting the land from our ancestors. We're borrowing it from our children. Any place that you occupy, you must leave it better than you found it. And all of these notions of time are about respecting the future, respecting what that future is going to look like. And we're not doing that. We're kind of living the future to odds that are kind of not in our control. And we're following this path of just like how much money can we make in the least time possible? That's really what Wall Street is doing. How much money can we make in the least time possible without caring about what it does for people? And I think that they are also like if you see the the profits of oil companies are at an all time high and people are paying the price. I think the reason why they're doing that is because they know that this era of fossil fuels will be over. So they want to take advantage of the last moments that they have. But it shouldn't be like that. It shouldn't be how much more can I exploit until I'm not allowed to anymore. It has to be a change in consciousness and say we already made so much profit. We have to hand it over to the next industry. And yeah, like that's just my perspective on that timeline is that it is not fair that you think that, for example, my own university that teaches me about climate, their timeline for neutrality, carbon neutrality is 2042 when I'm going to be 40 years old. For me, yeah, like I laughed when I saw that because how can an institution that has so much knowledge and so, so much academic potential and power and, is, and, power and, and money, money. <laughs> um, save timelines that are so, so far away. And it's just an institution. What's going to happen with countries? India is giving 2070 timelines. Nobody that is in power is going to be alive then. I'm going to be 68 by 2070. What is the world going to look like then? This is what I said in my COP26 speech. When I look out of the window, when I'm 50, I'm going to see the future that you're negotiating. What does that future look like? You decide now. That is what we're dealing with. The fact that every decision that we make now counts. The luxury of time is the fact that the now, it is what's going to dictate the tomorrow. And I don't think people are understanding that. How do you think about time in relationship to climate movements? Because that's also another framing of this, which is that these movements have taken place across time. I mean, going back to indigenous practices, going back more recently to the environmental movement of the 20th century. I was hoping you could talk a little bit about your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, that's a very interesting question because it really translates to what do you consider as an environmental movement? For me, it's about protecting territories, and that's what indigenous peoples do. They protect uh, 80% of the world's biodiversity. But not only that, if there weren't indigenous communities around, there would be nothing left to protect, which is what we are not understanding. And that's why we have to protect the defenders. And then the second question is defenders defending from what? And the answer is all of these extractive industries. So... The climate movement is in this cycle of bringing in other movements. That is what's happening because of how it exacerbates every other single social injustice. So now we're talking about environmental racism and environmental justice. We're talking about the link between gender and climate. We're talking about the link, for example, labor rights and workers in the fashion industry and how much these industries are producing. Millions of tons of waste per year. And so that is how I see the climate movement in timeline. It's not really linear. It's kind of like a a sphere expanding and taking in more movements with it. And I think that that's what makes the climate movement so special and why I am a climate activist. It's because I see it as an opportunity for our causes to come together, for the people who want to build a better world. And the fact that it's only seen as environmentalism is too short of a notion because environmentalism means to cut the relationship between human and nature and just seeing it as something that protects nature and separates humans from that nature. And in reality, we are meant to be together with nature. Yeah, we're we, we're, we're, we are made uh, you know, out of Mother Earth. So 
all of these, for example, urban centers, there shouldn't be for cars. There shouldn't be for just buildings. There should be for us to feel like we are uh, an extended part of nature. I think, yeah, that's the, the beauty of this timeline is that it doesn't really have any linearity. It's growing in an exponential way. That's why you have seen the climate movement explode. I don't think my parents would have ever thought that millions of people were going to be out in the streets marching. And that's what's happening today. Who are some of the figures in this movement, the elders, I guess, so to speak, who you have turned to or learned from or found kind of solace or solidarity in their thinking? Um, you know, I'm thinking people like Jane Goodall or, or Bill McKibben, also your parents. <laughs> but I'm curious who comes to mind for you and thinking across time whose activism is is for you bringing you the most joy, the most kind of, to use a total cliche, inspiration, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, my parents, for sure, they met at the first Earth Summit in 1992, 10 years before I was born. And then they raised me with all of their knowledge. So the reason why I am who I am is because of my parents and how they have made it their life's mission to protect Mother Earth. And that is what I want the climate movement to be. I don't want it just to be about the scientific way of reducing warming and greenhouse gas emissions. I want it to be about justice and recognizing all of the effort and resilience that frontline communities have had to go through. In the broader sense of the word inspiration, I definitely have to say people like Bill McGibbon, Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, who is a wonderful oceanographer, Dr. Catherine Wilkinson, and a lot of mentors along the way. I'm thinking like even Al Gore, my parents worked for his daughter. So I've been, you know, in a lot of events with Al Gore and the way that he can, if you haven't watched a presentation where Al Gore talks about, you know, like that presentation where he does about the, the exponential, how emissions have risen exponentially along with temperature, it's just magnificent the way that he can change the world with a PowerPoint. So Al Gore definitely is up there. People like Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland, has been a huge voice in the climate justice movement. All of these people are allies. Allies because they understand what is at stake and they are giving their platform to this new generation to speak up. And I think the world elders is right because elders connotes wisdom. So I would also have to include my grandparents there because of everything that they have taught me and everything that they've gone through. My grandfather is an ejidatario, which in Mexico, it means like communal ownership of land. And he really has to sit on a chair on a piece of land to protect it so companies won't take it. That's what defending the earth looks like. The fact that you have to put your body on the line. And for me, that is inspirational because everything that I'm doing in New York is nothing compared to what my community is doing back home. So it is my responsibility to fight even harder and to use all of the avenues that I can to ask people to not just think about what they can do for climate activists, but what they can do for Mother Earth. And you've mentioned the documentary 2040 as being uh, particularly inspiring to you. And I was hoping you might share a little bit about why you appreciate that particular documentary so much. Yeah, 2040 is an amazing documentary that shows what the world would look like in 2040 if we implemented all of the existing climate solutions. We often get this narrative that we don't have the technology to deal with the climate crisis yet or that some type of innovation is going to come to suck the carbon out of the air. But the reality is that we already have all of these climate solutions. We just need to implement them. And that makes me very hopeful because then I didn't have to study climate science. I just had to study, I'm studying environmental studies with a concentration in policy to push all of these solutions forward across every sector. 2040 is about imagination. It's about what's possible when you put your mind to it. And it is about optimism because when all of these solutions are presented to you visually, you are able to think my city can look like that. My building can look like that. My country can look like this. And it is very, very hopeful. I often say that 
what youth have that adults don't is that energy to bring that imagination forward. And I love the African proverb that says, the youth run the fastest, but the elders know the path. So it is about the fact that we are going to have all of this energy to bring this imagination to life, but we cannot do it without the help of the people who know how these systems and institutions work. On an individual level, to go back to time for a second, <laughs> how do you think about time in your life, your work as an activist? You're about to start your junior year at UPenn. How do you balance all of this with your schoolwork? Yeah, tell me a little bit about time in your individual life. Well, time is crazy to everybody right now because of COVID. I was 17 when COVID started. I'm 20 now. I think 18, 19, 20 are pretty important years for a teenager. And we just didn't have them. I didn't have a graduation. I didn't have a prom. And I think it shows me how important these markers of time are, how important it is to close cycles correctly. And that is what I'm bringing to this work also. How do we close that cycle of dependence on the fossil fuel industry and open a new cycle? And this cannot be done if some people are like, yes or no, we all have to be on board. And that question about how we handle it. I mean, activism is writing emails, running around, running for those who have organizations, running your organization and participating in whatever organization you're part of, going to all these climate conferences. I was in nine countries in two months. The day that my school ended in May 10th, I left to my first conference and didn't stop until two weeks ago. So that's what climate activism is, is showing up. And it can be very tiring, which is why we are emphasizing the regenerative aspect of activism so much. And it's not just activism. Our culture right now is if you're not tired, you're not doing enough. If you're not on Slack all the time, you're not being productive. And I think that we have to give more time for ourselves yeah. to take care of yourself. Take first. care of yourself before yeah. you can take care of the world. Exactly. Yeah. So that is what we were dealing with being in these years of transitioning into adulthood, fighting for the planet to stay alive. And trying to do that, safeguarding who you are as a person and, and being able to experience that joy that we are fighting for as well. Hey everyone, taking a quick break here to tell you a little bit about our season six sponsor, Le Col, School of Jewelry Arts, which is supported by the Maison Van Cleef and Arpels. Over the past decade, L'Ecole has welcomed more than 50,000 students from 50 different nationalities through its programs. They've built two permanent campuses in Paris and Hong Kong, hosted nine traveling schools in Tokyo, Hong Kong, New York, and Dubai, and organized more than 300 conversations in 20 different cities. They've also created 18 exhibitions about subjects ranging from the work of the artist and former time-sensitive guest Daniel Brush, to precious art deco objects, to bird-shaped jewelry, and 26 publications about subjects including men's rings, necks, and cuffs. This year, celebrating their 10th anniversary, Lacole is introducing six new classes, presenting six exhibitions, and publishing eight new books. You can learn more about Lacole and its current and upcoming offerings at www.lecolevancleefarpels.com. That's www.lecolev. V-A-N-C-L-E-E-F-A-R-P-E-L-S dot com. And now, back to the episode. Turning to mobilization for a bit, what are some of the ways in which you've been able to get people across time and space mm. mobilized around climate? You know, you've talked about needing to do this through narrative and storytelling and have said that stories touch people, data doesn't. Um, what's been your approach to stirring people to action? Like, how have you done this over the past seven years and has it evolved or changed over time? Well, it has definitely changed um, because our understanding of how to communicate climate has changed. Um, I think we're noticing a lesser emphasis on scaring people into action and more like inspiring them into action. So that's what we're trying to do and doing that through storytelling. 
My friend Clover puts it very beautifully. The narrative of the world is being written by somebody else and it is our turn to rewrite that narrative. And that is why I think sharing our stories is important. Because if we're not sharing the human side of the climate crisis, and I think David has said this as well, we will not be able to touch people. And we will not be able to change people's perspective because they don't know what the life of somebody who lost their home to wildfires looks like. And sometimes it is that one story that changes your whole perspective on the world. I'm sure many people have that one moment. And for me, it was when my hometown flooded. Even though I grew up with my parents talking to me about climate all the time, it still was too far away from me in my mind. It still was 2100. It still was North Pole. And all of a sudden, it was my hometown is flooded and my grandmother had never seen this ever before. And it's not just water, it's contaminated water because we have a lot of factories throwing their waste there with no regards to how it's affecting the ecosystems or people. And following a drought. Following the harshest drought that Mexico has, and this is global, you know, droughts right now are at an all-time high because we've never been this hot before. The harshest drought Mexico had ever had in 70 years, seven decades. And so it was a a wake-up moment for me For me to realize I cannot wait to grow up, to get a degree and then do what my parents are doing. We have to do it now. And I think the power of being a young voice is kind of this moral high ground of what are you doing with my future? And I don't like to say that too often, but it is the truth. What are all these people doing with our futures? They're playing with it and we cannot allow that to happen. So we decided to use this storytelling to mobilize. And it worked like we never expected it to. The first climate strike um, that I organized in my high school had 600 kids from my high school, which was, 600 is so much already. Like imagine 600 kids going down a building with no permission from anybody going, (laughs) it was 5,000 of us citywide that day. All of the organizers from each school, we got together and started planning something bigger and bigger. By September 20th, from March to September, we got 300,000 people in the streets of New York with permits for 17,000. It exceeded all of our expectations. And that's because we created this narrative, our like little signs that strike with us, this narrative of the fact that it's not just youth mobilizing, but Adults have to join us and everybody had to join us. Some businesses closed down. We got City Hall to let all of the kids in the city strike without penalty. And it was just, I'm getting chills right now just to think of the power that 300,000 people on the streets has. And the reason why we're doing this is because no movement in the history of movements has succeeded without mass mobilization. We have to change culture, we have to change media, we have to change politics, we have to change business. But we cannot do all of that if there is not, you know, thousands of people behind that willingness to change and that willingness to strive for something better. Yeah, you see the conversation shift for Black Lives Matter also, you know. Yeah. Incredible scale. Yeah. To see the history of civil rights movement and recently Black Lives Matter in during the pandemic for us was evidence that people will come out if they have a cause. But they cannot do that if all of the data stays in academia, if all of the data stays up here. I think that if everybody in this city, in the world, knew about what companies are doing, knew about how we are giving away the health of our planet, everybody would be out. Everybody would be um, mobilizing. We're starting to see that. It got slowed down by COVID a lot. But I think that we are in a place that we've never been at before, where we have the opportunity to act upon the biggest crisis that we've ever faced. And I say it's an opportunity because... We are building a better world and we decide what that world looks like. I see no better thing than everybody being part of that, of that new narrative. 
connected to all of this, what are, are your thoughts as we head into New York Climate Summit this September, COP27 in Egypt in November? And what are some of the particular issues that you're wanting to highlight most right now? What are the things that you feel like are the most pressing? Well, we are talking about three demands at the global level, and they can look differently for every single country and city. The first one is the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, which basically is asking the United Nations to follow the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and do it about fossil fuels and say, really, what our problem is right now is that we keep giving all of these fossil fuel companies the license to keep extracting and burning. Right now, the energy crisis with Russia and Ukraine is being used for that narrative, the fact that we need more energy security. But these licenses that they're getting, they're not going to be usable for another 10 years. Like they wouldn't even open anything else in only in like five, 10 years. Like it's just the narrative that they're putting out there. Like we can cut all new fossil fuel permits now and still have that time for transition. So that's the first thing, the non-proliferation treaty. The second thing is ecocide law, which basically translates to making the destruction of nature a crime. This is specifically for hotspots like the Amazon rainforest, like our oceans. We just had the the ocean conference where we are highlighting the fact that the oceans have actually saved us from the worst effects of the climate crisis because they absorb so much carbon dioxide. But that is an acidification. 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 (laughs) The ocean, and it's obviously harming all of the marine life. So how do we make it illegal for all of these companies to not be able to exploit and destroy? And it's really about giving that legal pathway, speaking the same language as institutions to protect the earth. And the last one is the payment to Global South countries, the $100 billion a year payment for loss and damage. Because it's not just about mitigation adaptation, it's the fact that loss and damage have actually already happened. People are already losing their hometowns. They have witnessed damage to their way of life, to crops, to their ecosystems. And people need support for that, especially from the countries that are the most responsible. Yeah, I think at the US level really is about passing climate legislation, making sure it gets written into law and that we have that right to happiness that we deserve and that happiness comes from stability and really a clean environment. I wanted to bring up what you call stubborn optimism here because it is so different from certain tactics that have been taken in the climate movement. And Greta Thunberg has her approach, which tends to be unlike yours, a little bit more about despair. and But you've said despair is not an option, and you follow this line of thinking that diverse voices matter. It's not just about Greta. It's not just about being kind of divisive. It's about bringing people together. And even so, you know, PBS has still called you America's Greta Thunberg. (laughs) Um, I was wondering how you kind of view and think about this stubborn optimism, how you define it, and why it's so essential to your approach to language and communicating around the climate. Well, stubborn optimism was a term coined by Christiana Figueres, who was one of the architects of the Paris Agreement, meaning that she basically convinced all of the countries to sign the Paris Agreement which I don't know how she did that, but it's that passion that she has to make this planet a better place. Stubborn optimism really means to not give up. And I can tell you that I will never give up because there's always something to fight for. Optimism is not like for me, um, some people say like optimism is blinding you to what realism or like the reality of things. It's not that um, I don't know the reality of things. It's because I know the reality of things that I know how urgent change is. And that is what I hope more people embrace. 
the fact that our reality is telling us that naiveness is actually not doing anything. That naiveness is actually ignoring it. Naiveness is thinking that the problem will go away without doing anything about it. Optimism is about believing in ourselves and knowing that the things that we do all matter to build this better world. What you said about communication is very important because I don't want anybody who is scared and it has a mindset of a doomer to be part of these conversations and making the movement. Like imagine what the world looks like if a bunch of scary people are building it. Now imagine what the world can look like if a lot of hopeful optimism, open-minded people are building it. You see, it's like, it's a different world. So that's why I have this principle because I want this good energy to be reflected out there. In the words of my dad, if you don't have an organized room, you cannot organize a strike. If you don't have an organized set of principles, you cannot have that same legislation and policy follow. Yeah, that was very corny and and a little, (laughs) like you said, and the same lines of the inspiration, how cheesy it can get. But I truly do believe that. I think that... Organize your room. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) This is what's going to get us to the other side. Yeah. Well, strikes in and of themselves are in part about interrupting the timelines of capitalism. I was hoping you might speak here to the results as you see it of getting out on the streets and calling for change, but doing it in this way that you're talking about, which isn't about fear, isn't necessarily about doom and gloom. It's about urgency, Mm -hmm. but it's with optimism. Tell me a little bit about your approach to designing a strike, a march, a protest, and what you hope they collectively achieve over time. I'm going to be very honest with you. The perspective from youth activists on strikes is that they're not working anymore. And maybe that's because of COVID. The fact that we cannot organize thousands of people to come out anymore, and that is very reasonable. From my perspective, strikes are about disrupting our civic duty as students and thus call attention. But we have to go to the next step because strikes, I think they're historically extremely, extremely effective. But if they're expecting it because it became the norm, then it's not disrupting anymore. The reason why we strike is because we want to call attention. And once we get that attention, we get into the buildings that matter. We get to talk to the people who make the decisions. And we are kind of already doing that. We're already talking to presidents. We're already talking to CEOs. We're already talking to our institutions. And it's yet not enough. So the question is, what is next? And this might be surprising for a lot of people, but we are organizing an international occupation of schools where students across the world at universities, especially in the global north, are going to occupy our campuses, which has also been a very effective tactic to get change to happen because these schools have connections to all of the powerful people around the world and in the United States have the money from all the powerful people in the world. Who mostly attended said schools. Said schools. (laughs) (laughs) So that's next. I think your question was about how do you go about organizing these strikes? It's really about just telling the person next to you, hey, did you hear about that thing that's happening? And trying to sound, make it sound really cool. <laughs> that's really how we go about it. I'm sure TikTok helps, but... <laughs> yeah, it definitely does. I mean, the things that Gen Z can do with TikTok is just, we're unstoppable. <laughs> it's going to make a lot of people uncomfortable. What we've done, what we're going to do, and what we're going to have to keep doing But the message there is, if you were doing enough, none of these would have to be necessary and we could all get to work. There's very few things that students can do. We cannot vote with our money like they tell us to. Some of us cannot even vote because we're not citizens of the countries that we're in. Others because we're not old enough. The question becomes, what can we do? We can disrupt. We can call out and we can show the world that we are for serious and they have to reciprocate that concern. So yeah, that is our next plan. I hope you see us on the news. It's going to be very exciting. Well, this leads me to 
intergenerational cooperation, which is another large part of your activism work. And basically, it's this idea of across time conversations. How do you get a 20 year old and an 80 year old to connect and meet each other where they're at? And I was hoping you might tell me a little bit about your emphasis on this intergenerational dialogue. Mm -hmm particularly the roles of the youth and the elders meeting and coming together. I imagine this goes a lot back to that time equation where we started this interview. Yeah, I think a good example is in indigenous communities, we have youth and elder circles where youth talk to elders to listen to stories, to wisdom, and the elders listen to us. Uh, about our aspirations, about the way in which we're seeing the world, what's possible, the clarity that a lot of youth have. That allows elders to run the community better, to make decisions with us in mind. Imagine what the world would look like if every single president had a kid next to them all the time. What would climate negotiations look like if all the delegates had a youth next to them, looking at them with every decision that they made? We are often forgotten. And the reason why I'm so confident about that is because I am not thinking about what a 13-year-old is doing right now. <laughs> Maybe I should. So I know that somebody who is 50 is not caring about what a 20-year-old is doing. But we have to break those barriers of generations and really hold each other and say, what is your idea? What is your power? What are their ideas? And what is our power to change those ideas? And that intergenerational cooperation comes from the notion that it shouldn't be a fight between us. It should be, how do we use the resources that we have for the betterment of climate policy? And a lot of policymakers have, who are like very progressive on climate have asked us, can you organize something for this? Can you make uh, calls to the office to push for this legislation? Because without the power of numbers, it is also hard for legislation to pass. It's also hard for companies to feel pressure. So that's why we need each other, really. This understanding cannot happen if we're not talking to each other, if we're not in the same tables. And I see how uncomfortable that can be because I've been on those tables many, many times. And what I can really tell you is that for youth, that showing up is 50% of the work because just you being there is already having an impact. Even if you feel like your adults are not listening to you, just the fact that you're there is already making them see a different world than what they're used to. I was hoping you might speak to the past two and a half years in particular, COVID times basically, and what it's been like for you. I mean, despite a period of slowdown, it's been like a whirlwind from what I can tell. I mean, in April 2020, you co-founded Re-Earth Initiative, which is an international youth-led organization that focuses on highlighting these things we've been talking about, specifically intersectionality and the climate crisis. You graduated from Beacon High School. You enrolled at UPenn. In November 2021, you spoke at the UN Leadership Summit on Climate, which was hosted by the Biden administration. You gave the closing speech at the World Leaders Summit at COP26. You were recently on the cover of Vogue Mexico. This past May, you attended the Met Gala with Gabriella Hurst, alongside Venus Williams and Amy Schumer. How are you thinking about your life and work during this time? I, just reading these aloud, I'm like... <laughs> yeah, I'm like, what? <laughs> Even amidst this slowdown, you've managed to have your activism and visibility speed up, it seems. Well, it certainly didn't feel like that. And the reason is because being on the streets is where you feel the energy. But hearing the list, it makes me feel more accomplished than I felt before coming in here. <laughs> and I think that a lot of us, we have that mentality that we're not doing nearly enough. But for me, it's really about believing that one person's mind being changed can do so much. And I know that because Every single person who's an activist had their mind changed at some point. And that person has so much potential to do so, so, so much good in the world. So I think life has been crazy lately. It's been like 
a movie that I don't really want to be part of. And the reason why I say that it's because it's very weird for me to have visibility because of the climate crisis. I want to be seen because of my ability to discover something new or to create something new or something that doesn't rely on the fact that the planet is hurting. I think a lot of my peers can sympathize with that. The fact that we are making people, quote unquote, famous, not really because we're a very small niche still, based on the fact that we're speaking up for what's right is very odd. But I think it's also a good thing in the sense that we're not just speaking up for climate justice, we're speaking up for the values that we all have to have. So that platform helps us do that. It helps us say, you know, like one of the celebrities at the Met Gala asked me, okay, so what is the one thing I can do to be part of the climate solution? And obviously, I don't like that question because it's based on that individualistic mindset. But I said, well, how about you with all your resources only wear sustainable designers? And I guess the designer he wanted wasn't sustainable. So he kind of like looked away, a little ashamed. <laughs> you know, it's like all of these people with all of their resources who are not setting examples. And we see that with all of the talks about the private jets that celebrities are taking as well. If I had all the money in the world, I would be doing my best to have as low a carbon footprint as possible, first of all, but doing my best to give back to climate movements, which is what celebrities like Rihanna are doing. She gave $15 million to climate justice groups. But I really think about the fact that the people with the most means are doing the least to help a lot of the times. But the reason why they're still helpful in the movement is because they have such a big incidence in culture. We're not going to change the world if the music isn't changing, if the movies aren't changing, if the short stories, the novels aren't changing. So that's why I go to these spaces to see how I can change the culture through changing somebody's mind, which is right. a big Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wanted to ask if you could speak to your decision on attending the Met Gala, because I imagine it was probably met with some resistance from the climate yeah, community. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, as I see it, you were infiltrating from within. Yeah. Well, I went for, and I did have a lot of back and forth. First of all, I trust Gabriela a lot. So if I was going to go with anybody, it was only going to be Gabriela. And Gabriella Hurst. Gabriella Hurst. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Gabriella Hurst. And the reason why we became connected is because she saw me speak at COP26 about the experience of giving the speech at the World Leader Summit. And that experience was that when I went on stage, all of the world leaders had already walked out. And when she heard me say that, she said, Never again will I let this happen to youth activists. So now is she not only making sure this doesn't happen in her circles, but making new spaces for us. So I appreciated her so much for that. This is just a huge hug to Gabriela. The second reason why I went is because of that aspect of culture. We have to recognize that the people who are in these spaces are not just the rich people who are not doing much. They're the people who are creating every single entertainment that we consume. If we are not changing that, how are we going to get to millions and millions of people around the world? A billion people have not heard the words climate change around the world. How is that possible? A billion people. For me, it was a huge, I saw it as an opportunity to get into all these people's minds and say, so what are you doing for climate? Some people had good responses and some people said, well, you know, I only drive one car, not two. <laughs> but yeah, the movement, I think nobody told me to my face that I shouldn't have gone, which I think was very odd, but I definitely know of a lot of people who didn't say it to my face. And I think they're totally right, because if I saw somebody else going, I would definitely be like, what are they doing there in an event that glorifies this fast-paced, fast fashion, fast consumeristic culture? And I think my reasoning at the end of the day was that climate justice narrative has to be in every space. 
And we have to use that to change the people who have the power of visibility. And there is a fashion bent to a lot of what you do. And you've partnered with brands like Levi's. You've done a social campaign with Nike. You were named most likely to save the planet for a project for the fashion website, Refinery29. You attended Paris Fashion Week. I mean, tell me about your relationship to the fashion industry and also your hopes for engaging with it. Like, do you see it as a halo for the, let's say, more important work, which is Mm. really raising awareness about your activism and the climate crisis? Well, for me, it's very weird because I am not a fashionable person. I wouldn't consider myself one. There's a lot of people in the climate movement who think like, oh, obviously I'm going to care about sustainable fashion and thrifting and all of these things because I want to merge my passion, which is fashion, with climate. For me, it was more about recognizing the power that these CEOs have, the power that they have on making everybody get that one shirt because they made it trendy. How can we make good decisions trendy and not just trendy, but part of our lifestyle? I saw the fashion world as this huge thing that I had been ignoring with a huge power to change so much of what we perceive to be like the change that is possible through systems. So when I went, for example, to the... Global Fashion Summit, which is where hundreds of brands meet to talk about what they're doing for the environment. I saw so much greenwashing. I saw so much, I'm going to reduce my emissions, but duplicate my production. I saw so much of people not being in touch with the realities of, for example, in the Atacama Desert in Chile, all of the waste clothes that people don't end up wearing end up there. Or this also happens in a lot of places in Southeast Asia, in Africa, where companies are saying, oh, we send them as secondhand to people who need clothes, but they end up with piles and piles of textile waste that are so huge that the earth cannot breathe, people cannot breathe. So I went on stage at the Global Fashion Summit in front of all of these brands, and I told them that they needed to get serious, that we weren't going to allow the fashion world to keep doing what it's doing to us, which is have that mindset of micro trends and buying a lot and feel like you need to change your style every other day. What about loving your clothes? What about my dad who has shoes from 1995? What about the fact that maybe one day my kid is going to wear these pants? Where did that tradition go? Where did that relationship with the things that you wear go. Heirlooms. Yeah, heirlooms. Where did that go? And everybody was making announcements. We announced this. We announced that. I said, I announced that I will never buy anything new again. Their face dropped because what if all of Gen Z decides that we're never going to buy anything new again? We have enough clothes now to clothe ourselves for the next at least three decades. We don't need to produce any more clothes as of now. Isn't that crazy? It's not like food that it goes bad and then we have a lot of food waste and we have to rethink our food systems. It's totally different for clothes. And so it makes me excited to talk about this because I see some, I'm getting so many ideas of what we can do. (laughs) I did want to end before we finish on the subject of indigenous wisdom and honoring the past. You've spoken a little bit about it during the interview, but I was hoping you might share some of the Otomi traditions and also for you, what some of the most profound aspects of this culture are that you bring into your day-to-day life and the perspectives that you want to share and teach other people? Well, I'll share that my first notion of the world as it stands is that we're still waiting for that innovation to come. What we have to do is remember where we come from. Remember what really is important. If you think of the people who have a lot of money, who are buying islands and having their own private jets, at the end of the day, they use this money for happiness, if you think about it. We can get that happiness without all of the extra steps of destroying the world. At the end of the day, 
who is happy without family, without community? I think my indigenous upbringing taught me the values that I've mentioned before of reciprocity, intergenerational cooperation, the youth and elder communication, definitely resilience. But most of all, the connection that we must have with Mother Earth. Because we forget that we are here to protect the planet. What if all of us saw that as our purpose? And maybe it's kind of weird for some people to hear this. But for me, it's very clear. My purpose on this planet is to protect the body that gives us life. And how wonderful is it that we have figured out our purpose already? The constitution of my country, Mexico, says that every person has the right to a healthy environment and to your development, your own development. And the United Nations just made that a universal right, the right to a healthy environment. I think this is instrumental and it is product of all of the work that indigenous communities have done. We are not asking people to change the practices. We're not asking you to do ceremony with us. We're not asking you to change the way that you maybe consume your food or to start harvesting yourself. We're asking you to change your mindset to one of interconnectedness, to one of respect, to one of realizing that everybody deserves dignity. And also, like I said before, without indigenous people protecting the earth, there would be nothing left to protect. So it is your duty to give that protection to not let some governments and some companies destroy that autonomy. So that is some of the things that I will share. The fact that indigenous culture is about being thankful of the four elements, of the four directions, of the relationship with one another. Most of all, an indicator of the fact that we have to always go back to what matters inside, not the aspirations of what the world is telling you to go for. This notion of taking care of earth as a practice, I so appreciate. And I just wish everyone could wake up and approach their days with that. Hopefully one day, maybe they will. It's never too late to start. (laughs) Shihei, thank you so much for coming in today. It was great to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Extra thanks to our Season 6 sponsor, Le Col School of Jewelry Arts, which is supported by the Maison, Van Cleef, and Arpels. A unique place for learning, Le Col welcomes the general public to the world of jewelry through courses, conferences, exhibitions, videos, and book publications. You can find out more about Le Col at www.lecolvancleefarpels.com. That's www.lecolevancleefarpels.com. And thank you for listening. You can find more episodes of Time Sensitive on our website, timesensitive.fm, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can listen to our other podcasts at a distance by heading to at a distance podcast.com. You can follow us on Instagram at slowdown.tv. And if you like our programs, please be sure to subscribe and leave comments. Our theme music was composed by Billy Martin. This episode was produced by Ramon Broza, Emily Jang, and Johnny Simon.